Hi, my name is Richard Duffy. I'm the SAP Business One Product Evangelist and I am part of the SAP Global SME team. What I'd like to do in today's presentation is take you through the seven steps to marketing success. Now the seven steps to marketing success really forms the basis of a marketing system. And that marketing system is something that uh, a gentleman by the name of John Jantz and his company Duct Tape Marketing have been implementing in thousands of small businesses all around the world. So it's the fundamental basis of today's presentation. So I just want to acknowledge that right when we get started and you'll hear me talking about John and you'll hear me talking about the duct tape marketing approach as we go through. So I would encourage you if you want to find out more about duct tape marketing and how it can help you uh, that you go and check out uh, the duct tape marketing site at www ducttapemarketing.com and uh, see what it is that John and his team have put together. Now I'm an authorized duct tape marketing consultant. That means I'm licensed and authorized to present these materials to you. So just wanted to get that on the table just so everybody understands the background and where we're coming from here. So first and foremost uh, as we get into the body of the presentation I'd like to start off with the definition of marketing. And chances are if I, if we were all in a room together, there would be a number of you who come from a marketing background. And if I was to ask you for your definition of marketing, I'm sure I'd get a lot of different definitions. And most of those de definitions would be partially right. But interestingly enough, when you work with smaller businesses, there really isn't a definition of marketing that makes a heck of a lot of sense for small businesses and certainly not something which you can go up to a small business person and say well look you know this is the textbook definition of marketing and have them immediately say ah yep I understand what you what you're talking about I get it so a definition of marketing that has been put together by the duct tape marketing team as a result of working with thousands of small businesses all around the world that I kind of like and being a person who had their own small business, being a person who ran a business that was involved in the implementation of ERP solutions for small businesses, this was something that when I heard it, I immediately said, yes, that does sum up what marketing is about. And that is that marketing is getting people with the need for your product or service to know, like, and trust you so that they try, buy, repeat by and refer others to you and I think it's become a, a definition that the more I speak with SAP Business One partners around the world it really becomes more and more relevant all the time. So if you think about that definition and is it relevant for you I would ask you the question how many of you have a marketing budget of a million dollars per year? Now I wouldn't imagine that there'd be too many of you in this audience who are watching this presentation today. Because if you've got that kind of money, it's kind of quite easy to buy this concept of know, like, and trust through a blitz marketing campaign, spending thousands of dollars on press ads, thousands of dollars on TV ads, advertising in the top rating television programs, and so on. But I would imagine that there aren't too many of you in this room who do have that kind of budget. So what I'm going to suggest to you is that we need to take a very, very systematic approach to building this concept of know, like, and trust. Now, a lot of things have been changing over the last few years, or at least if you read what's being talked about out there, is that publications would like to suggest that everything has changed about marketing. And I would like to put to you that a lot of the tools and technologies have changed, but I don't really believe the fundamentals have changed one bit. In fact, I want to share a movie with you that I suspect some of you may have seen or you certainly know the basis of this video, which is a classic ad by McGraw-Hill and it was what's called the man in the chair ad. This is a little bit of a new take on it. I don't know who you are. I don't know your company. 
I don't know your company's product. I don't know what your company stands for. I don't know your company's customers. I don't know your company's record. I don't know your company's reputation. Now, what was it you wanted to sell me? There you go. Yeah, John, I'm looking for him on LinkedIn. I don't see him anywhere. Let me put you on hold. He's on the other line. Yeah, so I got your proposal, but I don't know who you are. Uh-huh. Got to put you on hold. Be right back. Yeah, John, you find anything more on these guys? Really? Okay. Later. Yeah, so as I was saying, I got your proposal, but I don't really know your company. I didn't see much about you on Google. Your website is totally thin. I looked for you on LinkedIn. No luck. But someone in my online community seems to think of you as a third tier player. And I see an ex-employee out there is doing some pretty nasty blogging about your CEO. <laughs> now, what was it you wanted to sell me? So most of the audiences that I've shown that clip to it really seems to hit home with. You know, I think this is one of the big challenges that we face as marketers, certainly if you're working with small businesses, is the challenge that for many of us, we're all a little bit overwhelmed. But I will say that one of the things that we have to embrace, and it's a key thing as we move forward, and we're going to talk quite a lot about it this year, and that is simply that the internet and digital interactivity is now at the center of marketing. Now that doesn't mean that the fundamentals have been replaced, but the way that your messages are communicated out to your market have changed significantly. So building out your web presence has to be job number one. It's now the core of marketing. That doesn't mean, again, as I said, that we're gonna ditch everything that we're doing in favor of it, but it absolutely has to be the foundation that you're going to build on top of. So in terms of a systematic approach to marketing, here are the steps. And again, you don't have to read every single one of these because I am going to go over each one. But it's the foundational A to Z curriculum based approach that, that I have certainly seen has been able to be applied and what has happened as a result of that is that there aren't too many industries out there where this system has been applied and it hasn't worked. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the steps. But fundamentally, the first one, which is really the key one, is probably the most underutilized, and that's strategy before tactics. Strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. I mean, the challenge we have as marketers and as small business owners as well is we want to take the idea of the week. And speaking from my perspective as a previous small business owner, I can subscribe to this. Small business owners are absolutely the worst at this. Because why? Because you're doing a hundred different things. And for most of us, marketing is not our strong suite. It's not the thing that we are best at. So what tends to happen is the shiny new object that, that makes the most noise this week tends to be the marketing plan. You end up with the tactic du jour. Now I would suggest to you that this point makes some marketers nervous when I say this but I would suggest that if you get the strategy part right in your marketing approach you can surround it with just about any set of tactics that you perform and measure consistently. That's how important the strategy piece is. And we all talk about it, but so many, or so few rather, of us actually do it or understand what it even is, this concept of strategy. So I'm gonna suggest that there are two very, very important and significant components 
to getting a marketing strategy down for a business and that is to narrow your focus on an ideal client and an ideal customer and find some way to clearly differentiate your business. Now these aren't earth shattering ideas but I would like to suggest to you that we probably aren't thinking about them as thoroughly as we could. The idea of narrowing your focus. Most small businesses, most businesses in general, it's the nature of things for them to try to be all things to all people. Matter of fact, you think about it, you don't try to be all things to all people, it just kind of happens. You go into business, the phone rings one day, person on the other end of the line says, can you do X? Your immediate response, sure, how hard can it be? Next thing you know, new vision start. You're trying to serve every kind of client who suggests they might actually have money to spend with you. And the problem with that, as I'm sure you probably have found if you've been down this path, is you simply can't do it. And it leads to that kind of engagement where nobody is happy. I don't know if you've ever taken on a client that you knew you probably shouldn't have taken on about five minutes into the engagement. You find yourself sitting there saying, what was I thinking? You can't serve that kind of client then, and quite frankly, not only are they going to distract you from what you should be doing, but they're probably going to turn into detractors because you can't serve them effectively. So I use the word ideal very, very intentionally. What you really need to do is think specifically about this concept of what is an ideal customer. Now, people have been talking about target markets for years, but I believe that in our kind of business, it is so much deeper than that. So an ideal customer is one that values you, uh, values what you do, values your unique approach. An ideal customer is profitable, and that might sound crazy, right? All customers are profitable. Well, um, oftentimes, uh, many organizations don't necessarily sit down and really do a, a, a careful study of their customer base and determine which customers are the right customers, which customers are actually the most profitable. So in fact, if I had a big whiteboard up here, one of the things that I would draw is a four quadrant consulting box and I'd say, okay, let's put all your clients down here that are not profitable and in a quadrant down to the left and also the ones that don't refer business to you. Put all your clients that are profitable but don't refer business to you in another quadrant. Now in the bottom right hand corner put clients who are referring business to you that are not profitable. Now and then in the upper right quadrant that's reserved for clients that are profitable and refer business. So think about it, do you have any of those? Nine times out of ten, if you can identify your most profitable clients who are also referring business to you, there's a very, very, very strong chance that you can look specifically at what, what is the makeup of those clients I and mean, then it's those clients that you are uniquely suited to serve. Not only are they profitable, but they're probably doing, or you're probably doing the right kind of work that fits into where you really want to be, and you're doing it very, very well. But people don't refer unless they're happy. So that's also the type of client that's having a good experience with your firm. If you think about it, what it really comes down to is identifying who those clients are because they're the ones that you are trying to attract. Now, we talk about the things that we find in those clients who are up in that upper right quadrant. What do they look like? What are their common characteristics? Maybe there's a couple of specific things, but the demographics, the psychographics, the ge geographics, these are the all the kinds of things that that people are used to measuring. Where are they located? What do they think? What are they like? Are they early adopters? Are they in a particular location? But then there's this last piece, which is really a key area, which is their behavior. What kind of challenge are they having? Are there certain things that they do? Perhaps certain characteristics they have, like being on a, you know, a board or being in an association uh, as a member that's a behavior that you might find is a common characteristic amongst your most ideal clients. So the idea behind this is then to create or draw a picture so thorough of your ideal customer so that if I came up to you and asked you how I would spot your ideal client, you'd be able to 
paint me a picture that I would absolutely know somebody who looked like that, acted like that, or had that challenge. And that's part number, but part number one. Part number two is the idea of differentiating and dominating. You absolutely have to have or find or create some way as part of your strategy to differentiate your business from every other business that says they do what you do. Now, this isn't a new concept, but one of the things I've found, it's one of the hardest to get businesses to actually do because they think that what they do is that's unique, unfortunately, in most cases, is something that everyone either can do or claim to do. I'll give you one of the challenges, or if you like a bit of homework, go out and visit the websites of your top five competitors, cut and paste the first paragraph right off that website, put it on a Word document, and include yours as well. Now, black out any references to any of the company names, pass them around the office, or if you're really feeling daring, pass it around to your customers and see if they can identify one from another. One of the things that typically happens is you find out you're all saying the exact same thing. We provide great service is not a differentiator. Providing great service is what you have to do to even be in the playing field. If I was to ask all of you participating in today's webinar, how many of you provide really bad service? Not a single one of you. So I'm guessing you all feel and in some cases suggest that you do provide great service. So that's not a differentiator. Here's what you need to do. Another homework assignment. Go out and interview your top eight or ten ideal clients. Have you ever done that? Have you ever gone out and sat down with them and asked them some questions? Why did you buy from us? So look at some of these questions. For example, ask them first, if you were looking for a company like ours, what would you Google? That way you'll understand what your target customers are actually putting into search engines. So suddenly you now have some keywords that you can start doing some search engine optimization around. What made you decide to hire us? What is one of the things that we do that's better than everybody else that you know that does what we do? What could we do better? And tough kind of a question, would you refer us to other people or do you refer us? Now important point to note, this is an interview. This is something that you have to do either face to face or on the phone. The answers you're going to get here are gold. They are going to help you define so much of what your marketing strategy is about. So please, please, please resist the urge to send this out in an email blast. Sit in front of your customers and ask them the questions and don't let them off the hook. When you say or when you ask the question, what do you do better than other people? If you're doing a good job at all, you know what they're going to say, right? Well, you guys provide good service. Well, ask them the question, what does good service look like? Tell me a story or tell me a time when we provided good service. What did that look like? One of the things that I've seen quite clearly is right out of the mouths of your best clients will come what we call your core talkable difference, your core point of differentiation. Because most of the time, as business owners, as marketers, we don't really know what our customers appreciate because we want to talk about the, the stuff, you know, the grand benefits and our competitive advantage. And most of the time, what our customers really appreciate is something that we might think is kind of down here. It's a little thing. It's not really that sexy, but it is what we do like nobody else does and that's what you need to tap and make a significant element of your marketing. It's not easy and that's one of the key things, you know, thinking about these questions because a lot of the times we want to be like everybody else. We don't want to be different. We want to be we want to be like everybody else because then it makes it easy for us to go, go out there and say, "Look, point me at five successful businesses that are just like me and I'll just copy what they do." But that what I've really found is that doesn't work effectively so stepping outside the box is essential it's actually how you'll be able to start charging a premium for your services through your products but it's also one of the hardest things you'll ever do if you're receiving phone calls and inquiries you'll know one of the first questions is 
how much is it going to cost? There's a really good chance you're not differentiating your business because if I can't tell how you're different, I'm going to use the one measure that I can understand and that is the price. And as probably most of you have discovered, competing on price is not a great place to compete because there's always somebody who's going to be willing to go out of business faster than you. It's the things on this particular slide that we're talking about are the things that people really like. Yes, it might be your unique products and services, but sometimes it's the way you deliver those products and services. It's your people, it's the experience, it's some kind of over-the-top guarantee or the way you package and deliver your solution. It's how you position your business against a problem that everybody in the industry is having. That's what people buy no matter what you sell. So I'm going to step away and I'm going to give you an example right now, but I'm not going to pick an example in our industry because I think that, that what John's put together here is an example of, a, of an architectural firm and it's a really, really great example of what they did and how they differentiated themselves. And this is part of the process that you'll go through, which is really answering that question, what do you do for a living? We implement... ERP systems. Well, is that really what you do? We'll, we'll go through this case study and then we'll come back and have a discussion about that particular question. So in the in the situation for, for this particular company, which was a firm of architects, those people, when you ask them, they say, well, we're an architect. We design buildings. Now, I think I know what that is or I don't need it. Okay, well, that's kind of nice. In this particular case, I don't know if any of you have had any experience in the building industry. This particular architect worked with general building contractors and in the way that the world used to work in commercial construction, well at least in the US where this case study comes from, people hire the architect, the architect starts the project and then they bring in contractors to bid on being part of the project. Well, then what happened was the contractors started saying, we're going to create this thing called design build. We'll run the whole thing for you. So we'll partner with an architect and we'll bring, this, bring you the complete package. Essentially, because architects were, were afraid to, to do marketing, they essentially stole the game from the architects. Now, this one particular architect said, I'm fine with that. I actually just want more business. So what John did is he went out and interviewed that architect's customers. Those same questions I just told you about uh, and they kept hearing over and over again. He said the core difference was that he designed a building like nobody else knew how to. But his customers said, yeah, well he, he's got those letters after his name. We expected that that would be the case. But let me tell you what he really does is he cuts through all the if you like the city hall red tape and he gets us paid faster so when you sit down and think about it when a number of different people said that he helps us get paid faster he cuts through the red tape there was a real pattern starting to come up so then the situation became when asked what do you do for a living the architects were then able to say we help contractors get paid faster. The natural response to that is, well, tell me a little bit more about how you do that, instead of, oh, yeah, I don't need an architect today. So this is where he repositioned his entire business to where he became the contractor's architect. Now, this is a, a, a particular example where a third or a fourth tier architect because of the work they did here, they were really able to reposition themselves and now they've become the first tier architect in their market by simply embracing a core message that clearly differentiated their business. And really, that's how powerful this can be. After that, all the tactics that were then executed were not even really that important. So what I'd like to do is introduce to you a new concept around this idea of the tactics. Maybe as a small business owner or maybe as a marketer you're familiar with the concept of a marketing funnel. You get a whole bunch of leads in the top of the funnel, choke them until a few squeeze out and the good news is now we've got Twitter and Facebook, we've got 500 million more good leads we can throw into the funnel. But what I'd like to suggest 
to you is that instead of spending all of your time and energy on trying to create more at the top of the funnel, if you spent more of your time on converting the leads that you have and creating and providing a remarkable customer experience, you would never have to lead generate again. What am I talking about here? If it comes to lead referral generation, the customer experience is everything. So the marketing hourglass suggests that there's actually a, a, a way of doing things. Now, don't worry too much about all the letters in black uh, because those will be blank for you. These are just examples of some of the things that you can do in your marketing hourglass. But what it suggests to you is that there's a logical progression at which every customer comes to know like and trust you and there are specific things that you can do as they move through that marketing hourglass to the point where they try buy repeat and ideally refer others to you then what we need to do is build processes and products and touches and services at each one of these points so that we move people along to where every customer that comes to know us also becomes an advocate or referral source. So that's where you're trying to get to. And that's how you build your entire business. What most people's marketing hourglass looks like is they run an ad so that you'll call them, then they come out and try and sell you something. So people want to go from no straight to try without having spent any time building the like and the trust. And one of the things about the this marketing system is by spending a lot of time on that like and trust, you will end up with customers who appreciate your unique approach, that value your people, who understand what it is that you do, who don't argue about your bills because you've taken the time during the sales cycle to educate them about what it is that you do. Now, if you go straight from no to buy, then obviously they have no understanding of all of those things about your business. So the logical step in is that there is a, an education process which is quite frankly as important to you as a business as it is to them in learning about what you do. So you're actually educating them so that they can become an ideal customer or what they can decide, hey, you're not talking about me. You know, you're not the right kind of supplier for me. Our business objectives are not in alignment. You don't actually serve my kind of business. Once we move a prospect down this process of know, like, and trust, they actually have a way for them to try or to sample what it is that you have or to have um, a lower barrier to entry you need to look at what your what your products and services are and try and figure out a way to build some kind of product or service that gives your prospects the ability to try out what it is that you have to offer so then let's talk about these products and services so you'll obviously have your core product and service question is, once you have somebody who comes on board and signs up for that core product or service, do you actually have a process to go about measuring the results? Actually measure that you're delivering what you said you were going to deliver. Most businesses don't. Once somebody becomes a client, it tends to be a bit of a case of you know, the, the business drops the ball because that was the end game, getting them as a client. Well, I'm going to suggest that if you subscribe to this idea, the end game is actually getting them to refer other people to you and you can't get that to occur unless you've delivered on your on the, the, the results that you promised. Did your client get that result? And then once you've determined that, I would suggest you have a process to move immediately to referral. So for, for each one of you that's participating today, I would suggest take this, this map, this hourglass, and fill it in and think, okay, what are we doing at this touch point? What are we doing to get people to know about us? What are we doing to get them to like us, to trust us, and so on and so forth? If you would like a copy of this marketing hourglass that you can then use and fill in, I use it as a template, please reach out to me via email richard.duffy at sap.com. I'd be more than happy to send you a copy. So then think about 
your you know your your product and service mix strategy what's your free or trial offering what's your starter offering do you have a making it easy to switch offering to get people to move from a, a competitor's solution what's your core offering can you clearly articulate what it is that you have what are your complementary solutions that increase value do you have a members only offering that allows people to buy in to working with you at different levels where they're paying potentially a premium for working with you at that level do you have strategic partners that you work with together to deliver complementary value added services you need to start thinking about all of these different aspects in the in the process to really help people move through uh, through that funnel so point number three I know a lot of you are tired of hearing that you have to produce content but it's become the expectation I mean if you think you want to know something about a person a company a product or a challenge that you have what do you do you go onto Google become it's because it's become the expectation that you can go to Google type in your search string and find the information that you want now if we as businesses are not producing that same type of content or producing content that's being found by people that are doing that I don't care what you're selling whether it's ERP solutions shoes or legal services most purchases start or involve some kind of search or looking for some kind of content on the internet or some kind of search for information so regardless of how or who your prospective clients actually hire or where they go to buy they're going to go out and look it look for that content but content has to fall in two categories one the content has to build trust so that can be a simple educate as simple as educational content in fact the easiest way to start building this content is writing blogs or having blogs as part of your marketing communication now it's not because somebody wants to sit down and read your blog every day it's because search engines love blogs blogging software is one of the easiest ways for you to actually produce and update content it's easiest for people to, to look at and subscribe to it's how you get found so think about it know like and trust it's how people get to know you you know if you then think about it it's not just because you have the blogging software that, that that makes this happen it's because you go out there and you put the content into it obviously social media has really produced some great opportunities for you to go out there and connect with other people and to build that trust but you've got to go out and plan those social media profiles even if you don't have an idea yet what you're going to do on Twitter or what you're going to do on YouTube you need to be building out those profiles you need to be building your your real estate on the internet we need content that educates and purely educates people about what it is that we do things like white papers webinars talking about specific topics frequently asked questions and events you know success stories these kinds of things what this does is this educates your prospects that you have the answer that you are the experts so many times people will say well gee I don't want to give all that information away but in all honesty I don't think you can give enough away when it comes to this kind of thing because people don't want to know what you do yeah they don't want to know what you do they want to know how you do what you do and that you know what it is that you're doing now this is really that center point of, of marketing so how do you get to this well really what you've got to start looking at doing is you've got to create a total web presence you've got to have a website or you're not in business well now really you've actually got to be involved in social media as well or you're 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 not you're not really active on the web we're going to talk a little bit more about that so let's look at some statistics and these are a little bit old these statistics but fundamentally what we're now starting to see is more and more people are taking advantage of what's being done out there utilizing the internet utilizing these social networks and social media 73 percent of online users read a blog 57 percent join social networks 83 percent have viewed a video online 36 percent think more positively about companies that have blogs and in the US alone more than 77% of US adults use the internet as an information source when shopping locally for products and services. Now, the key word here is locally. 
because a lot of small businesses, uh, a lot of businesses even in our industry will push back and say, look, I've got a, I've got a yellow pages ad or I'm well known in my, in my market or whatever the case may be and I don't need to be in all these places. I guarantee you that you do. I'll give you an interesting story. A couple of my kids, and my kids are all teenagers now, I can sit the yellow pages down in front of them and they would walk around it. They have absolutely no idea how to use it. They pull out a phone if they want to go to a dentist. They don't even go to the web. They pull out a phone, type in dentist, and wherever the pin drops in their Google Maps, that's their new dentist in some cases. So getting this right is absolutely essential if you're focused on a particular geographical area. There's so many great tools for doing this. I'm not going to you know, talk about these. We'll run out of time. But over the rest of this year, we're going to introduce you through to a lot of those tools. So we have to use those tools effectively. We have to use those tools like Google Reader, Google Alerts, Twitter Search and Twitter Advanced Search so we can first understand the best way to engage our customers. So really this is about this idea of listening first. We have to start thinking about how we're going to optimize our web content and the way we optimize our web content is making sure that we're addressing the topics that that our customers want to hear about. Now you then need to go out and claim your real estate. Make sure you can get your company name on the web, get your get a company name on YouTube, on Twitter and so on and so forth. So that's really critical. And again, later in the over the course of this year, we're going to walk you through step by step how to do all of these things. Optimizing your brand assets, taking advantage of ratings and reviews from your existing customers and using the web and some web-based tools to help you to do that. Now that will vary from country to country. Some countries like the US are particularly advanced with these kinds of things. Other countries are still coming on board with this so a lot of that's going to be impacted by where you are. But I would encourage you to go out and find out what the tools are in your particular country that, that are working effectively. And of course, one of the key pillars of a web presence is your social media participation. The point that I'm making here is no matter what you do, your corporate website becomes the central point for all of this and will link out to everything else that you do, whether it's podcasts, blogs, videos on a YouTube channel, online PR, your social profiles, reviews of your products and services from customers, pictures of your people, all of those kinds of different services that you can that you can engage with will all revolve around your corporate website at the central point. The next stage, once you've given that some thought and you've looked at how you're going to incorporate that is to make sure that you do have an inbound lead generation trio. So what am I talking about here? The lead generation trio, advertising, public relations and referral systems. Most of the time our advertising is now most effectively pointed back at online events or your blog or a free white paper or an ebook instead of something that's a pure call to action, let us come out so we can sell you something. So that creation of that content becomes very, very critical and we'll talk more about that over time. The second area, public relations, and that's changed very, very dramatically and it's still a very important piece of the lead generation trio. Some of the social media tools that are actually out there now have made it even easier to get uh, media coverage. Now, now the great thing about this is we're all effectively publishers now. You don't have to rely on journalists alone to get your message out. One of the things that you could potentially do is identify the five or six journalists uh, who write the content that is most important to your business or write about topics that are most relevant to your customers. There's a good chance they write a blog. You can actually subscribe to Google Alerts and every time that journalist writes something, you can have a notification in your email inbox that they've written something. Then you can go and start interacting with them. You comment on their blog and engage those journalists in ways that you can build relationships like you have never been able to before. It used to be the previous process was you'd fax them a press release and hope it would actually make it to their desk. Now you can have a conversation directly with them and they can't hide. So I'd ask you the question, are you taking advantage of that? A lot of the presentations I do these days are really about referrals. The bottom line in the marketing hourglass is this idea that the 
the more referable you are, you know, the more the easier it's going to be to get customers refer to refer you. But you have to have a specific process in place to encourage those referrals to take those referrals when you get them to go out there and work with those customers who are referred to you and really take advantage of what's happening there when people give you those referrals. But there's a very systematic approach to targeting both clients and strategic partners to get them to give you referrals and that's really around educating them. How would they spot your ideal referral, your ideal customer and that process you can build as part of your marketing system. If you think about this this area about advertising, I mean fundamentally what you're looking at here is that your advertising that you do does have to be very narrowly targeted. It has to be a two-step process which has to be direct response. You have to get give people a reason to contact you and this is where this content really becomes very very important to give people a reason to reach out to you whether it's to download a white paper whether it's to participate in a webinar whatever the case may be you really do have to get them to to, to reach out and make contact with you with public relations it's all about those relationships we talked about how you start utilizing those tools today and then once you start building those relationships you're in a position where you can start pitching uh, a particular story to a journalist again if you're building those relationships with journalists you need to make sure that you do have some kind of monthly touch and use some of the online press release tools if they exist in your industry of course finally when it comes to referrals the best way to generate more referrals is to be more referable. Target specifically who you want to get referrals from. Educate the people who you want to pass you referrals. Provide them special offers and of course the key is make sure you follow up anytime you get a referral. So one of the very first things that you need to also then look at once you've you know you're thinking about putting into place some kind of system that helps you drive your marketing is you need to think about once you have generated the lead what happens and I would suggest to you that selling is a system as well now as an SAP partner you're kind of lucky we actually have a sales system it's called the synchronized customer engagement lifecycle but I would suggest you have to go back one step further and get really really basic you know and start looking at lead conversion systems when the phone rings when somebody responds to an online offer that you've made what do you do you've generated a lead what do you do with it now I'm not suggesting that everybody in the audience is doing this but I've got to tell you many businesses leave it completely to chance so there is a very systematic approach and you need to build processes around that. So what are we going to do? What's our next step to get people to know, like and trust us once the phone rings or the email comes in? One of the things that I would suggest is going to work, could work particularly well for you is, is what I would call an internal seminar. It might be a presentation, it might be a sales call. But is there a thought that you give to how you're actually going to relay the information and how you're different. In a long sales cycle, do you have a set of processes so you nurture those leads, so you keep in front of those prospects, so you stay top of mind? That has to become part of your thought process as you're thinking about your lead conversion system. Do you have a results review? Do you do win-loss analysis? One of the things that we find is particularly effective is to build something called a new customer kit and one of the things that I've heard is that this for those businesses who have implemented this new customer kit is it's changed everything about the relationship or at least how the relationship starts with a customer when they started putting together and sending out these new customer kits and simply it's just a way to orient a new customer here's what here's the people in our organization that you need to know here's what we agreed to here's what's going to happen next here's what we need from you in order to take action here's what you can expect from us you know think about it even the concept of a customer charter putting all of that into a customer charter you can expect the following from us in return we'll expect the following things from you and then having simple communication that gets those points across is how you get sale number two sale number three and that's then how you start getting referrals 
the last thing I'd like to leave you with, uh, and we've talked about a lot of things here, and uh, potentially you're overwhelmed by all these different topics that we've covered. But the thing that I would say is a lot of people, they look at this and they go, oh my God, I've got to go right back to basics. You know, been doing everything wrong or we've got to re-engineer all of our processes. Well, I don't know about you, but a lot of the time when I'm overwhelmed, what happens to me is I go into shutdown. I do nothing. One of the things that I would suggest is you have to look at this in a completely different way. And a great way of doing that is to start thinking about these activities that you have to do and putting them on a calendar. Most of you, I would imagine, plan to be in business six months from now. If you look at all of these activities that you that you need to do, look at mapping these things out a calendar. So if you decided to come along and, and, and give up your time to listen to this presentation and maybe you, you're sitting there thinking, well, this is a you know 60th time I've been told I've got a I've got to do a blog so what the heck I'm gonna jump in and I'm gonna do it so what if that's what you've decided to do what if that's your project or your theme what are you gonna cover what if that's next month's theme so let's take that as an example let's say you've decided you're gonna start doing a blog so you map out a month or six months or a year on the calendar and you say you know what I can't do all of these things this month but what are we going to do next month? You know, next month we're going to start our blog. The, what are the weekly actions that we're going to need to take in order to get to that point? Here's a suggestion. Schedule marketing appointments with yourself where you allocate time to sit down and think about all of these different things that you need to do. I'm going to write a blog. I've got to do some uh, tweeting, whatever the case may be. But schedule those things out on a calendar. So if you start thinking about it in terms of making those daily appointments, what's going to happen when suddenly you start thinking about this and taking this approach is at the end of six months, all of a sudden you will have built up an entire system or at least you'll have a lot of the pieces in place that can actually build some marketing momentum rather than simply relying on whatever wheel squeaks the loudest. That brings today's presentation to a close. Hopefully you've derive some value from spending time with me in today's presentation. I've been able to give you a little bit of an overview of some of these different steps to marketing success. Now this is just the starting point. Over the next couple of months you're going to be hearing more and more from us at SAP and from me particularly covering off on each one of these different areas. If what I've talked about today has got you really thinking about what you can do tomorrow what and you want to start taking action very, very simple. All you need to do, drop me an email. My email address is richard.duffy at sap.com. I'd love to talk with you. Uh, keep an eye out on the channel partner portal and the newsletters as we start publishing more and more information about where how we're going to help you along this journey to marketing success. Thanks again for taking the time to, to, to join us today. And on behalf of everybody at SAP, I'd like to wish you all the very best and a very successful 2011. Thank you.